My entrances usually aren't this dramatic, I promise. <laughs> so it's 5 a.m. on the Thursday of finals week here at CSULB. And it's one of those mornings where you wake up exhausted already, thinking about all the things you didn't get done the day before and that you still have to do that day. Instinctively, I reach over for my cell phone to start scrolling through my email until I see this message that makes me pause. Dear Professor Shea, I'm sorry for the late notice, but I will be unable to complete the assignment by the due date. If you could please accept it, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you for your understanding, student X. I heave a heavy sigh and put my phone down. I am so tired. And the weight of all the exhaustion I've been carrying around all semester suddenly hits me as I read student X's message. And my immediate response is, thank you for your understanding? What understanding? Do you understand that I am trying to balance grading for your class, studying for the class I'm taking, supporting my two adult children, parenting my teenager and my preschooler, training for a half marathon, coordinating a church ministry? Um, wait, did I forget something else? Oh yeah, writing under a deadline. And sometimes I forget to eat and take a shower. So I don't have time for understanding and I don't have time for late papers because I'm just trying to crawl to the finish line. And I can feel that end of semester frenzy as it's barreling towards me and I'm about to jump into the rabbit hole when I pause. And I realize that perhaps in their own way, my student is in exactly the same place. When we think about a rigorous education and educational excellence, often we think about academic success as measured by a series of tests. We think of excellence as comparing scores, and we ask all students to fulfill the literally impossible task of being above the norm without considering what the norm actually represents and who these individual students are the unique contributions they bring into classrooms, and what it means that we're asking them all to conform to one narrow standard of greatness. We order, rank, and evaluate our students, and it starts in schools by well-meaning educators who say, if you just work a little bit harder, you'll reach academic success, which will lead you to career success, which will lead you to happiness. Don't you want to be happy? We all want to be happy. And on the other hand, if you're testing far below basic, you just have so far to go before you can actually be happy. So what are the costs and consequences of this definition of academic excellence? Well, in schools and universities across the US and around the world, we've seen a narrowing of curriculum and a focus on standardized test prep that leaves us thinking inside of boxes instead of engaging with the world creatively. In addition to the institutional costs, there are individual costs no matter where you fall in the academic hierarchy. Those students who are pushed out of the system or stuck in intervention or remediation classes are told to think inside of a box, inside of a bubble, and not engage creatively. And for those of us towards the top of the academic hierarchy, those of us who have been successful in traditional education, we often feel like we're in a hamster wheel where we have to keep running faster and faster, producing more and better results, constantly running and running, but we're actually not going anywhere. And as I said, it doesn't matter where you are on the academic hierarchy because this definition of excellence causes us all to wonder what we're actually worth. I am somebody who has been fortunate to be pretty successful in terms of academic excellence in my life, right? That's how you get a PhD and come to teach teachers, right? You have ac academic excellence. And yet, what most people don't see is how often I question my own worth. Whether 
It's not getting a concept as quickly as I think I should, forgetting exactly what I'm supposed to say next in this talk, forgetting something on my shopping list, whether it's because my four-year-old won't listen to a simple direction that I give her, I constantly find myself asking, why are you such a failure? And even on those days where I manage to get all the things done on my to-do list that I have to do, I wonder, is this excellence? And if it is, is it worth it, given how exhausted I feel at the end of the day? And it's not just me. Recently, I was at my son's academic magnet school. This is a school that promotes students with excellence, right? They have to test to get in. And not only are they academically excellent, but they're students who are contributing to their school and local community. Yet, when they were asked, what is it you wish your parents knew? These were some of their heartbreaking responses. I wish my parents knew how hard I'm trying. Or, sorry, that I'm trying my hardest. I wish they knew how much I worry about my academic performance in order to satisfy them. I wish my parents knew that the expectations and pressure they put on my grades continually crush me every day, and that they appreciated how hard I work rather than dismissing my lack of A through a punishment taking away everything that makes me happy. And I wish I could say it was just me or the peers at my son's school. Actually, I don't wish I could say that because I don't want it to be anybody, but it's more than them too. I also hear this from my very own students. My students, many of whom are the first in their families to go to college and who have so much to give to future students in their own classrooms. They are students who bring things from their own educational experiences. They're learning in the credential program to design innovative and relevant lessons that engage students. And they've often spent years working in and outside of school with youth. Yet, so many of them are kept out of classrooms by standardized tests, one narrow measure of their content knowledge. So what if we had a different view of educational excellence and excellence in general? What if excellence was more than just an exhaustive list of individual accomplishments and more of a collective, empowering process? While this idea may seem radical, it's not totally original. More than 50 years ago, Brazilian educational philosopher Paulo Freire envisioned a system of education designed on liberation, transformation, and humanization. And he defined humanization as the process of becoming creative and transformative persons who engage in and with their world. Can you imagine with me for a moment how our world would be different if every student if every person in this room, if every person outside these doors was working on becoming a transformative and creative individual who was engaging in and with their world. It sounds pretty great, right? But if we're going to reimagine excellence in this way, we need ways to get there, right? Because the ways that we're going right now are not going to lead us there. So. One of the ways that we can get there, at least in the classroom, is through something called humanizing pedagogies, right? Which is a complicated educational jargony way of saying that we can learn to listen to one another. That we can learn through engaging with perspectives that each person brings into a learning situation, as long as we're clear and acknowledge that there are differences in power in any situation. So here's what I mean simply. Right? It's that we think of education as a teacher teaching students, one person teaching many students. Right? But what if teachers and students entered into relationship together, deep relationships where each person knew what the other brought into a situation? 
what if we engaged in reciprocal relationships where I could teach you in one moment and you could teach me in the next? How would learning be different in that way if we could listen to and learn from one another? Now, that's a great idea, right? And we can all support that. Yes, everybody's opinions are valid and important. But here's the thing. Education doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in societies. And in societies, different people have more or less power. I'll give you an example. I am the same person pretty much all the time, right? But in some situations, I'm given more respect and authority because I have a PhD and a title. And in other situations, I, the exact same person, am given less respect because I'm a woman of color and a mother. Right, so our powers shift in different situations. And when we have power, we have responsibility. We have responsibility to make space for the voices of those who are less often heard. And it's not just about the idea of making space. It's about aligning our actions with our beliefs so that if we say we want to hear the voices of others, that we actually listen to and engage with them in powerful ways. So here's an example from my classroom. My classroom is clearly a space in which I have power. I'm the professor. And so I was inspired recently by my son's, uh, by the activity at my son's school to ask my students, so what is it you wish I knew? And I got a lot of really great responses, and they were very validating, and they said how great I am, and I felt really good, and I was like, yay, I'm doing everything right. And then I read this response. I wish Dr. Shane knew that Twitter and photographs make me uncomfortable. And I have some students in the audience today, and they are laughing, and they're laughing because they know that Twitter is a regular part of the way I run my classroom, right? So I believe in sharing on social media the things that we do in our classroom because I believe it makes our learning more public, that others can learn from our space and what we're learning. So I do this regularly, and my first reaction in response to this response was, okay, um, well, if I just explain better why I'm doing what I'm doing, then my student will be like, oh, yeah, you know, that, that's okay. You, you just keep doing you, right? And maybe that would have been true, except that I had already explained why it was that I shared Twitter and photographs from the classroom. So then I knew I was giving this talk, and I was like, wait a second, are you really practicing humanizing pedagogies? And so I started to think, what was the humanity behind this response? Like, what was the very human request that was here? What was it that my student really wanted me to know? And what I had to sit with was that something that I was very comfortable with and something that I really believed in was making my student uncomfortable. And so then I had to think, if my goal is to make our learning public, is it necessary for me to put photographs when I tweet about our class. And when I thought about it, I realized, you know, it really isn't. I can still make our learning public without doing this part that is making my student uncomfortable. And so the very next class, I came in and I said, you know, I read this response and whoever wrote it, I don't know who wrote it, I just want you to know I'm not gonna tweet any more photographs from this class. And that day, in the anonymous exit ticket out the door post-it that I was reading, somebody said, I feel relieved. So in doing that small change to the way that I handle my classes, I was actually opening the door to greater educational excellence, both for my student, who now can sit and learn in a place where they are not only more comfortable, but also feel seen, heard, and acknowledged. But I was also opening the space of excellence for myself. I had to think more deeply about what my educational goals were and whether those practices really aligned with what I was doing. And so that opened the space of educational excellence for our entire community as I modeled what it was to be a better educator by and for students. So this is all nice, 
right? In the educational realm, I'm an educator. There are educators I know in the audience. But what about those of you who aren't educators? What's the point of humanizing practices in your own lives? Well, humanizing practices aren't just for the classroom. In fact, they can help us bring excellence to all areas of our life, particularly in our relationships with others and with ourselves. So one example, and you guys will think that I live on social media, which is more or less true, um, because my next example is also about social media. But, you know, we're in an election year, and election years cause a lot of controversy on social media. So you may recently have seen a post by someone you love who's dear to you, a close friend or a family member on a social media platform, and you see it and you're like, I cannot believe they posted that thing. That is so ignorant. Did they even fact check? What is wrong with them? And if you're anything like me, you begin typing furiously on your keyboard or getting your thumbs ready on your phone, and you're like, see, I have the argument for this, and I can't believe, and what? And And you're just about to hit send, but I would encourage you to pause for a moment before you hit send and reread that message and see if you were the recipient of that message, no matter how justified it is, how that would impact your relationship with the sender. See, I think disagreement is necessary sometimes, right? We're not going to always agree with other people's perspectives. But by speaking in and through the relationships we have with people, by accessing points of mutual care and concern, we can confront perspectives in ways that still honor people's humanity. And that in and of itself is transformative. But it's not just on social media. It's actually in life too. I know some of you out there are parents. And I want to tell you that the greatest teacher for me in humanizing practices is my four-year-old. And I want to say that it's never too early to start learning from the children around you. So here's what my four-year-old has taught me about excellence. She has taught me that excellence really isn't about all the things you do. It's actually about those moments where I'm most present with her. It's about making time for play. She's taught me that excellent storytelling isn't about having your B's and D's face the right direction. It's about bringing yourself to the story. And my 14-year-old, he's not a bad teacher too. In fact, he taught me that I should try again and audition for this TEDx talk. Um, But he also teaches me that I don't have to take every single leadership opportunity that's presented to me or participate in every single activity to be excellent. In fact, it's better to do less, but do what you're really passionate about. He and I are both working on caring less about what other people think about us and more about what our internal compass tells us is truly excellent. Now, again, as someone who's done well, who has, by external measures, seemed excellent to most people in the world, I've had a lot of trouble disentangling my accomplishments from my sense of excellence and my sense of worth. But reclaiming my excellence has been worth it. I know now that my excellence cannot be measured by the number of degrees I have, how many things I get done in a day, or how many right or wrong answers I have on a test. And truly, your excellence cannot be measured by these things either. If we must measure excellence, perhaps we can begin to measure it in moments. Moments spent on the car ride to and from school with my son, listening to K-pop or taking him to his first concert. Moments spent reading the tweets of my former students when they share about the excellent things that their students are doing. Moments spent learning and growing, writing and rewriting, preparing and practicing this talk. I'd like to invite you all on this journey towards this new form of excellence, 
one that asks us to change our perspectives, but may allow us to be more present to the moments in life that make us human and that make life beautiful. We can, of course, continue to sharpen our number two pencils and run on our hamster wheels, or we can begin working together and walking on this journey towards excellence, creating a world where we can all engage in and with one another. The choice is ours together. Thank you.